never visited any country in Africa. <laughs> but already I was taught to sing this song that Africa will be saved. Amen. Now, if you are an African, it doesn't matter where you are, man. Come on! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> you know what saves you out as an African, my brother? I went to Germany just before the fall of the war. And I'm sure you can guess which Germany I visited. <laughs> <coughs> so I don't have to tell you. It's Germany. It's Germany. <laughs> you can guess <laughs> the Germany I visited. Another label. GDR. Now, the part of the wall was gone. Because, uh, you know, if people don't want it, uh, it doesn't matter whether it is in GDR or where, or, if people don't want it, they will vote with their feet and they will make sure what they don't want is gone. Doesn't matter where. And so they already started to show signs that this wall is going to fall. Now that man was shouting, uh, Gorbachev, break down that wall. He was just saying, uh, politicians are opportunists by, by their nature. So, <laughs> He was just seeing an opportunity and shouted it. So he was not a hero, but the people there were heroes because they knew that they were going to fall. So I arrived at that time in, uh, in Germany. But immediately what struck me when we tried to sneak to the other Germany, we were on this side, but we sneaked to the other side. Well, they were the other side. The first thing I was warned, hey, be careful, don't walk at night. Why? Your color. <laughs> what color? Your color. <laughs> <laughs> eh? I've been having this black cop for many years. Eh? And so my black cop is the same as a black cop of other people there. If I go under a bridge at night, I was told, I was warned, don't go under a bridge at night because those fellows are walking around and they will kill you. Eh? I will. What's wrong with my color? <laughs> and so it doesn't matter where you are. Come on. Africans. Doesn't matter where you are. And one thing that makes me proud about uh, Nigerians is what uh, I told uh, your, uh, your ambassador. Yeah. My friend is a uh, passenger in uh, Nigeria. I used to work very closely with him during the Commonwealth time. Um, because he was heading the African Union and then we were asked to uh, sort out the uh, something in Zimbabwe and I was with him with one of your ministers of uh, foreign affairs I just forget his name now but it was a tall handsome minister I go more maybe you. also was using that tape <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was very slim, <laughs> very slim. I used to admire him. He was very slim, wearing that regalia. The, 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 the typical Nigerian regalia. You know that regalia? He always liked it white. Um, that's what I used to admire about him. You know, he says to me one time, hey, your problem in South Africa, is that you are very humble. <laughs> and I, uh, eh? yeah, you, know, you are very humble. We Nigerians, <clears throat> probably we still need a lecture about uh, humility. <laughs> when we want to do it, it doesn't matter where, we Nigerians will do it and we'll make sure that it succeeds. <laughs> and that's what I like about uh, Nigerians. Because I've worked with uh, one minister of labor also in the, in the ILO who used to say to me, stop telling us that you are not, you don't want to be a, 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 a what do you call that thing, a, a, of Africa, a South Africa. You, you, South Africa man, Nigeria man, and uh, you know, and then Egypt would say also on the side, and us, 
we we big man so let's let's do it <laughs> in the ILO and then typical of us no we don't want to be a big brother and he said nonsense listen to this thing minister wake up in Nigeria we don't understand humility my brother <laughs> let's work it together and I remember one time we wanted to make him the president of uh, the, the International Labour Conference, but we were defeated by uh, the region you belong to. Yeah. Echoworks. Echoworks. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> but I have to be diplomatic. Yeah, I know Echoworks well. But we, we were defeated by that region. <laughs> And I, I felt so disappointed because uh, this fellow was so good and we have been ministers of labor for some time to an extent we are being told that we are uh, deans of uh, ministers of, of labor in the continent with one minister in the Cameroon as well. And so it is important that um, young people understand that um, this continent of ours, as Mandela once, um, once said, I just want to read the quote of one of the things that uh, Mandela said um, about uh, when he addressed the AU, so that I can I can stop because uh, when you ask me to speak about uh, a person like um, Mandela and what is it that young people must do, he he said, um, "O Mandela, I just want to quote you to read the quote. When the history of our struggle is written." It will tell a glorious tale of African solidarity, of Africa's adherence to principle. It will tell a moving story of sacrifices that the people of our continent made to ensure that intolerable insult to human dignity, the apartheid crime against humanity, become a thing of the past. As envisaged by Mandela in 1994, we believe that Africa is in the process of being reborn. But Africa is going to need leaders. And when I look around this table, I have hope. Leaders who love people. When I was given an opportunity to speak in one of uh, one or two memorial services uh, during the period I was home, I was saying to people, you know, of course you become unpopular when you say it as it is. When you speak the truth, you pick up a lot of enemies. People like lies and popularity and television. <laughs> And I was saying to people, you know, if we want to keep the legacy of Madiba, we must be proper Africans. This guy was talking about Ubuntu here. As a former minister of labor, I can tell you more stories about some of these game farms. But I won't do that for today. Because them too, I need to teach them a few lessons. <laughs> If we want to keep the legacy of Madiba as Africans, we must love people. Yes. At the moment, I'm sorry. I think in one place we visited with the Tabumbik, I was amazed when we received, and this is, I'm not going to call the country, when we received at the airport, we arrived very late because it was just for refueling. And so we arrived at about 1.30 a.m. There were young kids there who were wearing uh, tiny little skirts. Yes, they were, the skirts were beautiful that they were wearing. But all of us said to ourselves, young kids, 1.30 a.m. at the airport, 
And then they are carrying these flags of this country that I'm not going to call by name. We didn't take kindly to that. But unfortunately, you know, as it stands, it's difficult to say to this person, Mr. President, we are not enjoying this thing. <laughs> These kids must wake up tomorrow and go to school. But you are having them here at the airport. We must love people. And I made, I made an example about a ladder. The ladder is like this. And the top is usually small. So it goes like that. So I always say, the bulk of our people are at the bottom of the ladder. There are few people at the top. But one day, and that day is near. Don't say I'm preaching. It's near. <laughs> people are going to shake the ladder. And then I said, when we fall from the ladder, there will be no time for even a professional gathering of this nature where we can think about strategy and tactics. They won't give us that time. They will shake the ladder and shake it. And those of us with big tummies, I made an example about my tummy because I don't want to hurt other people. I have my pro own woman. You will have to decide whether it's going to be your tummy first or your head first. <laughs> and the dilemma you're going to have, you may not even touch the ground because people are angry. Yeah. And the first thing they will attack is the tummy. <laughs> because in their view, that's where our things are. <laughs> And in this country, we are the only one with the shining, big, plumpy, and huge tummy. When all of us are dying of hunger, there's only one man in the village, or many, who are dying of overfitting. <laughs> and today, we talk at UN platforms. That poverty must be won, must be defeated. Yes, we need more money to make sure that poverty is defeated. Rubbish. We, we can do better by just loving our people. And I'm, I hope that the professionals that are sitting here do not forget that that you left Nigeria it's a brain drain for Nigeria. And when you go back to Nigeria, it's a brain gain for Nigeria. And this to me worries me to the core, to the bone, sometimes that we think that uh, it is only speaking at uh, Carlton University and maybe Ottawa University and have Africa series and you think that you are solving the problems of Africa. Africa wants you there in Africa. So if you are accumulating resources, one thing my brother, uh, I will never say don't get rich. That I will never say. Especially as an African because it, it does seem that uh, it's only others who must be rich. Africans must not be rich, you must always be poor. No, no, you are not born poor, man, come on. Get rich if you can get rich, but always remember your roots. Remember. Remember where you come from. Never forget that I am an African. Now, there are many people in South Africa these days, when you say such things, they say, ah, he's a racist. You know, when I was a minister of labor, I had an answer, and nobody has challenged me. And I'm asking uh, those who are research, researchers here in the room to challenge me today. I'm going to say what I'm saying, what I used to say in parliament in South Africa. And I say to them, racism came to South Africa with three boats. And their commander was Jan van Riebeek. 
in 1652. Before he came, we knew no racism. We didn't even know that there's something called racism. And that is why, OB, you will find that this OB is also in the trans guy. I met a Cameroon uh, ambassador here. His surname has got his name has got something called Umbi. <laughs> and I was telling him Umbi <laughs> is there in my village. And it simple means ugly. Umbi. <laughs> <laughs> because we were traveling all over, enjoying our sheep and cattle. And they came. And do what was called buttering. Whatever, whatever that name means. Give me three kettles, I'll give you an earring. Or whatever, whatever. And then they fence. And then Amakosa had an expression. Because in this place that this man has fenced, there is what we call Ikoda. It's white. We, we, we uh, use it on our faces. And women will use uh, umemez in order to beautify themselves. Not the cream from the chemist, my brother, or your pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> but when you fence it now and say it belongs to you as, as this new arrival, yeah. now we can use it. And they coined this expression, And so, my brothers and sisters, if we want to honor Nelson Holishasha Mandela, I didn't know that we still have those green coats. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe my age, you know, <laughs> I understand. But the young people at least have these juicy ones where you can. <laughs> <laughs> or, you, or you do the Matiba Jive, you know, where, when it rings. <laughs> Because that one you can't do a Diba Jai for me. It's an old one, my brother. Of course, I'm not I'm not uh, sophisticated. I always ask my kids about ringtones because I, I can't um, I have a difficulty with ringtones. You know, let me just conclude by saying, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I agree with um, the Zambian economist. His name is uh, Moyo. The surname is Moyo. Udamis. And that surname Moyo, by the way, is in South Africa, in Zimbabwe. He's everywhere. My mother's name. Is that your mother's name? Yep. So that surname is everywhere. It proves what I was saying, that we were free, so we never brought racism in, uh, in, in, um, in South Africa. And, and this is what I said in Parliament, nobody has disputed me. In actual fact, I even mentioned the boats, Reicher, Prometaris, and Quiho. Those are the three boats. And he came with his wife and maybe with other seniors. But the rest of the crowd in those boats were men who raped our women. And this is well documented. And then thereafter, when you become closer to being Jan van Riebeek, you attempt quiet. When you are in the middle, colored. When you have a crayla array like uh, your hair, say, <laughs> oh, they put a, a stick of match. Oh, you go that side, you're going to be a careful. <laughs> we never had those things. Honestly, now in South Africa, we are stuck with that problem of having colors, of having this, of having that. And as a result, we have 11 official languages in South Africa. Besides, because we're trying to Unite these people, which is what Mandela asked us to do. And so Dambisa, because you are dealing mainly with economy here, he says, you know, she says, global slowdown is Africa's chance to stand up and shine. Global slowdown is Africa's chance to stand up and shine. 
And then she continues, the current state of the global economy is bad for the rest of the world, but good for Africa. Because we are rich, men. It's just that, uh, you know, please, man, take these brains back. So that oil we have in Nigeria, man, yeah, <laughs> can serve the African continent. Because you have oil there. And if we remove all these strange people from, from around that oil, there will be no more battles there. Because Africans don't fight. Africans don't make guns. Tell me, where, where, where do we make guns in Africa? <laughs> we got our sticks, man, and our spears, and other little uh, things, but guns come from elsewhere. And they make the job easy, they kill quickly, and, and what have you, because that's the aim of the gun, nothing else, to kill you quickly. You go to Congo. We have sent our soldiers in Congo now, um, in South Africa, because of that M23 problem. Now we are trying to make sure that uh, our colleagues uh, settle. But we know what's going to happen as soon as there is peace. I've seen it in Burundi. As soon as we establish peace, because our soldiers went there, I was there. And I can see who is coming in, who is seeing the opportunity. It's not the Africans. It's somebody else. And so, we want to keep the legacy of Mandela. We want to keep the name of Mandela rolling, ladies and gentlemen, because Africa is on the rise, whether people like it or not, and the future is in Africa. And this is evident by facts. I've, I've, I've stipulated a few, just one or two facts. Africa is expected to establish a free trade area by 2015 by combining the markets of 26 countries with a population of nearly 600 million people and a combined GDP of one trillion US dollars. Oh, that's Africa. Can you believe that? This is not Canada, no, but don't go. <laughs> Forming the basis for an Africa-wide free trade area, which could create a single market of 2,6 trillion US dollars. That's my continent. But it's going to need you who, are, who have already established some businesses who can show us the way how the RAN functions and so on, because there are so many things I do not understand, uh, that the RAN is uh, 10, 10 watt to a dollar. And, and one of the questions I was asking, they used to say I'm stupid, um, I must go and research. I used to say to them, look, I don't understand this thing. Who the hell is this market? Where is he? Can't we have a democratic meeting with him? So that he's more transparent. Because he takes a decision in a corner, I don't know whether it's a he or a she, <laughs> in a corner somewhere, and then we wake up, the round is 11 to a dollar. And the next day he decides six. <laughs> I still want to meet that person. So maybe you as business people here can show me where that person is, and I will lead the delegation to him for the sake of my company. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.